Hi, I'm Lee Kelso, host of the Health Call Live Radio Hour, and I am glad you're here to take a look at what doctors might offer you, the treatment you might face after you have a stroke to try, to try and prevent you from having another incident. So let's uh, meet our guest today. She is a neurologist, Linda Williams. Uh, she is with the Regan Streif Institute as a researcher, also affiliated with the Veterans Administration, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and the Indiana University School of Medicine. So thanks for joining us today. You're welcome, Lee. Glad to be here. So let's start with, uh, instead of thinking about how to avoid a second stroke, let's talk about how do I know what my risks are for having an initial stroke, that first stroke, is there any kind of a CT scan, a test, or any way to look and see just how great my risk might be? There aren't any great tests before someone has had a stroke uh, in a person who's completely asymptomatic. There are some risk scores that are available that kind of put together the factors that are related to vascular disease, both stroke and heart attack. One of the ones that is the most straightforward to use is the American Heart, American Stroke Association's Simple 7. If you go to their website, um, they have a patient-facing page, and you can put in information about your blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, your weight, whether you're a smoker, things like that, and that does give you an estimate of what your stroke risk might be. I always encourage patients to ask their primary care doctors as well there's uh, something called the atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease risk factor, ASCVD score. That's something that primary care doctors have been encouraged to use over the past 10 years or so as a way to guide um, their treatment of things like starting an aspirin or starting a cholesterol medicine for someone who's not yet had an event. So those are important things to have in conversation with your provider as well. So we need to think about it, stroke as, uh, just like you think of a heart attack, stroke is a brain attack. It's that urgent. And um, you know what? Maybe we should back up and explain to people exactly what an ischemic stroke is versus a hemorrhagic stroke. I'm not sure people really understand that. Yeah, that's great. I don't think they do either. Stroke is a term that um, is, uh, even after someone's had a stroke, they don't always exactly understand what's happened. And there are two broad types of stroke, as you mentioned, Lee. Ischemic stroke is the most common by far, about 85% of all strokes. Hemorrhagic stroke is the other type, that's about 15%. Um, and I always like to explain it to people sort of in construction terms. Uh, if you're a plumber, you're gonna understand stroke because it's all about the blood vessels, which are like the pipes that are carrying blood to your brain. Uh, an ischemic stroke is like a blocked pipe. So the blood can't get through, it can't get past, and any brain tissue down at the end of the line that's expecting blood flow that carries oxygen and glucose, that brain tissue is going to die. And in, in a stroke, it dies very quickly within minutes of the blood vessel being blocked. A hemorrhagic stroke is like a pipe that's burst. So the blood vessel breaks open and blood leaks into the brain and can cause problems both by putting pressure on the brain and sometimes by reducing the amount of blood flow then that gets past where the big blood clot is sitting in the brain. Great, a great explanation. I think that's gonna help a lot of people. So what we think happens is uh, a chunk of arterial plaque, so a collection of crud on the inside of the pipe, for lack of a better phrase, breaks loose and then gets to the brain and clogs up one of those arteries, correct? It can happen that way, or it can also sort of, without breaking loose, it can kind of develop in place. So the, the blood vessel can progressively become narrower, narrower, narrower until it finally completely blocks off. And that is something doctors might, you may hear doctors refer to as an arterial stenosis. That's right. Um, Blockage. Narrow. Stenosis yep. is the is the term that we use, and and what's really important in stroke and the the new guidelines statement that you referred to at the beginning of the hour on secondary prevention, really gets at this. But our job uh, as stroke doctors is to try to figure out what caused the stroke. One way that stroke is very different from heart attack and much more complicated is that there can be a number of different causes of stroke. In a heart attack the pathology that happens is almost always the same. There's cholesterol buildup in the arteries that are going to the heart, and there's blockage that occurs there because of that cholesterol buildup. And all the therapies we have for heart attacks are directed toward that. In stroke, however, you may have 
a similar kind of blockage in the carotid artery in the neck. That would be most similar to the heart attack scenario, but you might have a blockage slowly developing in a small blood vessel in the brain. You might have a blood clot sitting in the ventricle of the heart where a piece of that breaks off and there's not a problem with the arteries at all. Or you might have a condition where your body forms blood clots too easily. So there can be a whole wide range of things that can cause a stroke. And so directing treatment to specifically what the cause is, is one of the areas that we need to challenge ourselves to do better. So that's different, uh, that, that hasn't been done before? Well, I think we have always known about these different causes of stroke and different uh, sort of schemes have been developed to categorize them. But the guidelines, the way they've been written in the past, have not been directed specifically at these unique causes. Now, to some extent, they have been. We've always had specific studies about atrial fibrillation, for example, which is a common cause of stroke. Um, but to clearly separate out the guidelines into what recommendations go with what causes of stroke, and also the guidelines cont uh, contains uh, a section on how should we be evaluating patients with stroke. And I think those kinds of practical sort of steps that any physician, whether they're a neurologist or a stroke neurologist or a primary care doctor can look through and get some guidance about which patients do we really need to push harder to understand the cause of stroke so we can best prevent it instead of just treating it like a cookbook and pretending that one stroke is like any other, which is just simply not the case. Got it. So you mentioned atrial fibrillation. The atria are the two top chambers on the heart. And if they don't beat correctly and they kind of just quiver and, and you can get an accumulation of blood clots there, that's why AFib is so important to treat. And if your doctor tells you you have AFib, you need to really kind of follow up and make sure you're on top of all of that care. Um, so that's vascular right. disease generally, though, can be treated in a couple of different ways. Uh, you typically can use antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulant therapy. Can you just tell me what these guidelines tell us about how we approach that? Sure. That's and that's absolutely right. Uh, antiplatelet therapy for people who have blood vessel problems, blockages in the blood vessels, is by far the most common type of therapy that's used. An anticoagulant therapy, which is sometimes we say a stronger blood thinner, it's a blood thinner that works differently, is typically reserved for very specific indications like atrial fibrillation or a blood clot that's found in the heart. Um, the antiplatelet therapies have been used for, of course, decades and more. Aspirin is a very old drug. But some recent studies have shown that for patients with a recent TIA or transient ischemic attack, sometimes we call those a mini stroke, or a recent stroke, uh, dual antiplatelet, using two antiplatelet drugs together for a brief period of time is better than just using aspirin alone in preventing a second stroke. So obviously if I have one stroke, that means something's going on and I'm more at risk for another. Um, these transient ischemic attacks are uh, often um, missed, right? I mean, they can be very mild, and as the name implies, the transient, they come and go. What do I need to know about a TIA and what happens after a TIA? Yes, and, and you're right, Lee. These are very brief. They're transient by definition, usually 30 minutes or less. Sometimes they last a little bit longer than that, but they are very brief. And so as they resolve, often patients don't seek attention or maybe they mention it to their doctor later, months later, perhaps, and we, we potentially lose time. The worst scenario is when they don't mention it and then they have a large stroke, you know, weeks or a couple of months down the line. That's what we're trying to prevent. So TIAs and strokes, one of the things about them is they can present in many different ways. Again, we like to compare to heart attack as a similar kind of disease paradigm but heart attack has pretty consistent symptoms of presentation, whereas stroke can present with many different things. Some of the common uh, features of stroke include sudden loss of vision in one eye. So the vision just going black in one eye, sudden loss of the ability to speak. So you just can't get your words out or perhaps you all of a sudden can't understand words that other people are speaking to you. 
sudden drooping of the face or sudden weakness or numbness on one side of the body. Uh, I keep saying sudden because that's one of the key features for stroke that helps it separate out from other things like a medication effect or um, low blood pressure or something like that. The symptoms tend to come on very suddenly. A, um, a mnemonic that's been used frequently is fast. Mm -hmm. Face, drooping face, arm, which means weakness in the arm or leg. S is for speech and T is for time. Because if you think that you're having a stroke, if you're having a sudden onset of any of these symptoms, the most important thing is to immediately get to a place that can offer you treatment for stroke. As I mentioned earlier, the brain cells die very quickly after the loss of blood flow and treatment needs to be given, uh, intravenous treatment needs to be given within three to four and a half hours of when the symptoms began. So waiting and hoping that it will get better uh, or thinking maybe it's something else often brings, uh, unfortunately, uh, patients to us too late to get the needed therapy. Yeah, that is a... That is an emergency room visit, absolutely. And are we are we still treating with the, the tissue plasma, plasmogen activated, the TPA, the clot busting drug? We are. Um, there's some there's some new development in that area, though. There's uh, TPA has been around since 1996, um, and still remains the only FDA approved intravenous drug that can be given to help dissolve a blood clot. Uh, early on when someone is just having a stroke. And we know that receiving that medication means that the patient is more likely to be independent and able to do things on their own 90 days after the stroke. There's a new medication, sort of a cousin to TPA called Tenecteplase, works very, very similarly. The main difference is it can be given as a one-time injection instead of a one-hour infusion. So it's a little bit easier to give um, some studies have shown that it works as effectively and it's as safe or maybe slightly safer. It has not yet been FDA approved, but I expect that we'll see that happen in the next year or so. So in addition to all this urgent treatment, after the fact, the new guidelines counsel doctors to really get into the weeds and talk with patients about lifestyle factors. So let's approach that. What, what might my doctor be telling me? Well, I would hope that your doctor would be having a conversation with you about your diet. Um, there are a couple of diets that have been shown in large randomized studies to reduce the risk of stroke for certain types of patients. So if you're a patient with high blood pressure, uh, I, it would be great if doctors would have a conversation about a low salt diet. This is sometimes called the DASH diet, and it's been shown to be very effective in lowering blood pressure and also preventing a second stroke. So controlling the amount of salt in your diet and learning how to do that and how to make substitutions, meeting with a, a dietitian, if that's helpful to you to try to figure out how you can really tailor it for your own eating habits, that's uh, one, one big key that we can, we can offer. A second thing that you hear talked about a lot in the press, but um, unfortunately I don't think there's a lot of great understanding about it is what's called the Mediterranean diet. That's another type of diet that actually has been shown in randomized studies to reduce the risk of stroke. Um, and the new guidelines include a nice table for both the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet showing what are the general components of that diet. Um, things like olive oil, you know, low, um, lots of vegetables, but what are giving you guidance about what are the specific components when we say low salt diet or when we say Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. what are the kind of things and that that really means and how can you apply it to your own life? We have talked about the Mediterranean diet on this program many times and uh, a researcher suggested uh, you have to think of it this way, eat like you're a Mediterranean peasant. Absolutely. You're, you're not eating high on the hog here. You're not living in the villa. You're down on the shore and you've got to make do with fish and nuts and vegetables and things that you can gather. And that's the healthiest way to eat. I thought that was really interesting. I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, another uh, strategy that, uh, that I like to use, which is um, from a book, I'm blanking on the author's name, a famous author that's written a lot about uh, diet is only eat food that your grandmother would recognize as food. Uh -huh. uh, and we probably now need to say great grandmother. Yeah. Um, 
or only eat food that has five ingredients or less uh, in the ingredient list. Those getting back to eating whole foods and mm -hmm. not eating processed foods, um, I think that's an interesting area of research. And I think what we're learning is that processed foods are very related to the development of plaque uh, in the blood vessels and to poor blood vessel health in general. So uh, smoking is going to be something that your doctor will talk with you about. I don't think we need to say more about that. I think we all know the story on that. You've just got to find a way to stop. Um, controlling cholesterol is interesting. You know, we think of statins as being really just a drug for cholesterol reduction, but they can help prevent stroke. How does that work? Yes, that's right. And that's been a shift in the last 10 years. We used to think about what's your number? What's your low density lipoprotein or LDL number? That's the bad cholesterol. Um, and the number is somewhat important, but studies have shown that even for patients with, with a relatively normal LDL level, uh, the introduction of a statin after a first stroke helps prevent a second stroke. And so we worry less about what the number is today than we did maybe 10 or 15 years ago. That's probably because the statins have a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect. And if we think about the pipe, again, as our analogy for the blood vessel, um, how much cholesterol you have in your blood vessels is partly related to how much is circulating in your bloodstream. That's the number that we check. But also how sticky is the inside of the pipe? And so that's where the inflammation comes into play. And the statins reduce the amount of inflammation in the blood vessels. They can actually shrink the layer of cholesterol that's in the blood vessels over time. And so in that way, the statin medications have sort of a double effect that's protective for both stroke and heart attack. Okay, you're changing my mind. I've always sort of been kind of anti-statin uh, based on some other research I've read, but that's mm -hmm. that's pretty interesting. I, you're going to cause me to think differently about <laughs> statins here. Well, and you know, it's always an individual, uh, it's an, an individual decision, right? And so um, I don't think anyone's recommending that patients without risk factors who have a good cholesterol level, who are healthy, who've not had a stroke or a heart attack, it's not that those patients need to start on a statin, you know, at age 40 to prevent every possible vascular disease. That's where having a conversation with your doctor about your ASCVD score, which will tell you what is your likelihood of having some kind of major vascular event like stroke or heart attack in the next 10 years. And I think this is where medicine is going. It's certainly going this way for uh, pharmaceuticals, and it really needs to go this way for vascular disease as well. What is each individual's risk uh, based on your age, your family history, your, your blood pressure, your cholesterol level? And thinking about things that we can tailor to the individual is going to be the best way to prevent stroke and to do it in a way that fits an individual's lifestyle and will be sustainable for them. So I'm going to hit you with a question about, you mentioned earlier, uh, aspirin therapy. Uh, I've talked to a number of cardiologists who say, ah, the science isn't real great on whether it's preventative for heart attacks. What do we know about stroke? Is it something that I ought to be thinking about considering some aspirin therapy just as a stroke prevention tool? So aspirin, probably like your cardiologists, I would say for preventing a first stroke, we really don't have great evidence that aspirin prevents a first stroke. So we currently don't re recommend that someone in their 50s without stroke or heart attack start taking an aspirin specifically to prevent a stroke. We do know after a stroke or TIA, aspirin is beneficial in preventing a second stroke. It reduces the risk of stroke by probably around 20%. And so it's recommended as a secondary prevention medication but typically not recommended as a primary prevention medication. Well, if it's that effective on a secondary basis, <laughs> why, why, why not use it as a primary method? Why not use it as a primary? Yeah, and here again, I'm going to come back to the ASCVD score. I think if you are a person who, ha who has a very high risk of vascular events, but you just haven't had one yet, then the ASCVD score would tell us that aspirin is probably beneficial some of these studies in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it is beneficial require very large numbers of patients. If you're talking about patients who haven't had an event and studying them over a long period of time until they do have event, those studies are hard to do. They are 
have to be very large and they're very expensive. So we don't have a lot of those. But again, tailoring it to the person's risk. And if your risk of an event is high in the next 10 years, then aspirin may be indicated. And th that would be the patients for whom the best evidence is that aspirin might be beneficial in primary prevention. So one of the things we did not mention, but I think is important to at least touch on, and that is we need to be moving in activities, long periods of at the desk or in a chair or lying in bed are real risk factors. Yes, that's absolutely right. And uh, going back to your Mediterranean peasant, right? Those, mm -hmm. the, they weren't going to the gym or doing the elliptical or you know, getting on the Peloton, but they were doing activity uh, and they continue to do activity all throughout the day. And so that's really what's needed for both heart and brain health. So for stroke prevention, for heart attack prevention, and actually we haven't talked about this, but for maintaining cognitive skills, we think that little bits of activity throughout the day are what's really important. For stroke prevention, relatively small amounts of activity have been shown to be beneficial in reducing the risk of stroke. It doesn't have to be extremely aerobic activity, even moderate activity, walking 20 minutes a day, four times a week has been shown to reduce the risk of stroke. Um, and again, we think that it probably does that through a variety of mechanisms, both lowering blood pressure, lowering sort of the sticky proteins that are circulating in the blood, um, having a lot of good effects, uh, not only on the blood vessels, but the muscles and the heart. Um, so small amounts of physical activity are definitely beneficial in stroke prevention. Well, I can't thank you enough for your time today. That is Dr. Linda Williams. She is a neurologist, researcher with the Regan Street Institute, and also working with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, associated with the Indiana University School of Medicine. Thanks for your conversation with us today about new guidelines for stroke prevention. Thanks, Lee. Glad to be here.